so I can remember a time when I didn't care about what I ate. I can certainly remember that I cared that I ate, um, and I had certain foods that I really thought were important. Uh, most of those were orange, bright orange in particular. Um, uh, think orange slice or crush or think uh, Velveeta cheese singles. Singles is important there. <laughs> I also have a memory uh, as a small child growing up in Berlin of the breakfast table. And there at the breakfast table, every morning, we would grab a roll. Now, this is a baguette, but we would grab a roll and we would bring it to our ear, and we would listen to that crunch. And the way that that would crackle, the way that that would crunch, would tell us what we were in for, what we were looking, toward, looking for as an experience of, of that breakfast. And that's the interesting thing about food is culture, or for that matter, cuisine, is that it's entirely tenuous. It's an abstraction. We're not able to control it. We're influenced by the things that surround us. We at best mimic it and pass it along. When our preferences are merely a reaction to hunger, a base urge, and not an abstraction, the conversation stops. But as we're able to discriminate and discern the differences, that's when we open up a whole new chapter. That's when we open up a whole new volume because the conversation can finally expand. The interesting thing about the way that hunger works as a just simple food science is that you have a nerve that transfers or transmits from your stomach to your uh, hypothalamus, and it, uh, when your blood sugar is depressed in your stomach, it'll send a message, and the same center of our brain that regulates um, thirst or sexual drive regulates hunger. And That's what we've basically been able to solve. That's the problem that food scientists and commercial food scientists have been able to address. It's uh, unironically called the bliss point, by the way. This particular nexus of salt and fat and sugar to satisfy that particular urge. In other words, food scientists have figured out a way to balance those three things to make us both sated and feel full and crave more at the same time. Miraculous. But where does that leave us, and where does that leave the conversation? Sort of we, I have, I love orange food. Great. You love blue food. Even better. We're done. So, sociologically, there's an impact. I mean, think back a few generations, just a few generations. What was the repertoire of the average home cook? How many dishes? How many dishes then transferred to the next generation and the subsequent generation? I would wager that if you have the capacity to do seven days worth of dishes, if you can cook at home seven days without repeating one meal using exclusively uh, staple ingredients, sugar or flour, or eggs or milk, etc., you'd be in the extreme minority. As a comparable, about the same proportion of Americans as French people um, claim that they stay at home and eat six or seven days a week. It's a really interesting similarity. But the attitudes and the approach and the, the cultural pride that stems from that are entirely different. So when I was 15, I had the opportunity to uh, stay with a family in France, um, in a small town in the south of France, 15 years old, pack my bags, go. I remember it was one of the first nights, I can't remember if it was the first or second night, that we're sitting at the dinner table, 15 years old. We're sitting at the dinner table and uh, the first course comes, and I don't remember what it was, but I remember it was good. The second course came and went, and I don't remember what that was, but I remember it was pretty good. The third course came and went, I remember that was salad. I liked it. And then came a Tupperware container to the table. It was really revealed, and in, on that Tupperware were like six or seven different cheeses, artisan cheeses, you know, with the mold and the blah, blah, blah. And the host mother, who was just trying to connect and be sweet, she said to me, you're an American, you don't have to eat that. Now, first of all, I was hungry, so I was going to eat it. But secondly, I just find this so fascinating. Wait a minute. Somebody's telling me that I'm not supposed to eat something. They're assuming, this is the first time I was marginalized for not trying something. Right? 
And so that wasn't something that was acceptable to me. Years later, uh, I applied that same sort of uh, appreciation uh, to making bread. That was sort of the, the manifestation of what I thought was a simple product that required technique and high quality ingredients to make bread, a simple bread, baguette. Now, I thought I knew what baguette was at this point. I thought I'd understood that, it, well, you uh, flour, water, right, salt, air, because if you use ambient yeast, it's just air. And I thought I could roughly produce this thing. And after a year of toiling every, every day, every day to try and make something that was both crispy and pillowy and fluffy in the middle, that had that grenier, that cut that was indicative of the proper rise and proof, the gluten strength was in balance, the salt was appropriate, that the sour was appropriate. After a full year of every day, being unable to achieve that, we made our first perfect baguette. Great. It took another whole year to do another one, by the way. <laughs> um, but I think, that was, I think that was really instructive because the issue there was that um, what we had gone through, the process to learn that, had really honed our discerning abilities. In my opinion, matters of taste aren't personal. They measure a very specific thing. They measure quality. In other words, if I'm evaluating what I'm eating, I take into consideration the amount of craftsmanship and technique that went into that, the balance of certain things, the amount of effort that went into the products that were involved in this. That is what good taste is. Good taste is merely the ability to distinguish the things that have quality from the things that don't have quality, or have marginal quality, or have commercial value, but not necessarily quality. I would say that, <laughs> I would say that uh, there is a real power in the influence of cuisine. Even though it's an ephemeral quality, a nebulous quality, it has real manifestations. First of all, this is some, uh, a bit of history. About 200 years ago, there was a, a really sort of titan uh, figure in, the, in the, the pantheon of French chefs, a, a French guy named uh, Antoine Marie Carême. And uh, he's sort of famous for a number of things. He's famous for developing the double breasted suit and the toque that you might see as sort of the caricature of the chef. He encoded a ton of the classic French recipes and, and named them all after French places and people and et cetera, and gave them French names. And, gave the sauces French names, and to this day, those are still the techniques that are employed. But it wasn't just that, it was that he happened to also be chef to some really important people right at the time that France itself had lost the Napoleonic Wars, and was this close to being utterly divided. And at the Congress of Vienna, who was the person who was supposed to best uh, extol the virtues of French culture, and therefore the preservation of France itself, but the chef? the influence, the geopolitical influence of cuisine. And even today, you think about when we travel and where we care to do business and the people we care to do business with and what settings we want to have those business meetings in. Commerce is also influenced by cuisine. And a new approach to inspiration uh, in travel uh, and the conversation about food. The sort of rapid growth as I think this country now experiencing the sort of surge in farm-to-table interest as we return to roots now proliferates across the country. Now in places like Omaha and Smithville, Missouri, Bloomington, Indiana, across the country, the idea that we would have a relationship with the products and the producers of those products is a reality, not something that we see on television. This is great. This is the great explosion. This is a great revolution in the American sort of food experience. 
But where we face a dilemma, I suppose, in the next sort of stage moving forward, is just accepting that as the end of the conversation. Oh, great. There are great places and people doing interesting things. The reality is, the status quo, in fact, is a new phase. It's a return to the death phase. It's a return to the disassociation from generation to generation, the ever-shrinking repertoire of techniques. At the restaurant, we try to combat that by changing the menu every day, by making a real concerted effort to developing an infrastructure component. Because in each one of those relationships, this is how we pass along culture. To the producers that, produ that provide us with eggs, uh, to produce, to what that hog is supposed to eat, to the servers who decide to learn our wine list or, or to learn a beverage program, what does that mean in the long run? What does that provide in the long run? To the cooks who learn how to work in this type of a system, what does that offer? That's the infrastructure component. The benefit is people grow up and, and, and diversify, is that we get to fill in all of the little sort of ex exigent uh, uh, opportunities. This means they're available to everyone. This proliferation is something that we get to take pride in. This is something that we get to do every day. So if I've done my job, if I do my job tonight, and if I did my job last night, and if I did it appropriately, then everything that I created was destroyed. That's what I have to show for it. Everything's destroyed, the room is empty, right? After we sweep, all the crumbs are gone, and it's in the stillness and quiet, that's it. All we have, I would hope, would be the memory of that evening. And so this is the challenge, every day. Do we get to have this conversation all over again? Do we get to have the opportunity to offer this one more time? Thank you.